Captain, all the shaking's gonna fly her apart. Well then, fly her apart then. <laughs> oh, hello there. I'm Christy Erickson, uh, Deputy Executive Director, and this is Tales from History. And today we're gonna talk about the Bendix Corporation's contributions to the space program. When the United States and the USSR made the space race a part of the Cold War, the United States engaged many of the top aerospace companies to engineer and manufacture products. The Soviets launched the first satellite called Sputnik in 1957, and Yuri Gagarin was soon to follow as the first person in space in 1961. Shortly after Gagarin's flight, President John F. Kennedy set the nearly unimaginable goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth within that decade. The result would be an era of discovery that paved the way for advancement for the next 50 years, cementing America's spaceflight superiority. Taking a critical role in this achievement was South Bend's Bendix Corporation, whose employees worked on everything from landing gear to life support. And it was not only Neil Armstrong who first set foot on the moon, but a fleet of Bendix men and women who engineered and built his equipment. Without them, Armstrong's giant leap for mankind would not have been possible. But we couldn't go straight to the moon. For NASA, Project Gemini paved the way and sent two man crews into space to perfect the necessary techniques. And Bendix was involved even then with products such as the acquisition and tracking control system at NASA's Wallopa Island, Virginia Station of the Manned Space Flight Network. Two man teams called Gemineers operated the uh, acquisition aid system, which made contact and established the initial tracking of the astronaut spacecraft. And going to the moon required innovation, engineering, and an enormous amount of manpower. At the height of the Apollo program, over 400,000 workers were employed on the project. The craft sent to the moon featured the largest rocket ever built, uh, with the most complicated equipment ever designed and cost billions of dollars to develop and build and was actually the largest and most expensive peacetime project ever undertaken in the United States. But you can't land on the moon unless you have a craft that can land on the moon, uh, which is one of these called the Lunar Module. The contract for the LEM, which is what they abbreviated it to, was awarded to Grumman Aircraft in 1963, which delegated the $350 million project to several subcontractors, including the Bendix Corporation. Bendix was selected to design the landing gear, a decision based on years of experience. No vehicle before this had been designed to fly and land completely in the vacuum of space, so the closest analog was aircraft and Bendix was a leader in developing aircraft landing gear. Over the next several years, engineers designed and tested critical components for structural stability and shock absorption. Simplicity and weight reduction were key. More parts meant more points of failure, and a heavier LEM meant the mission required more fuel. Though initial designs featured three legs, studies at Bendix led by engineer Raymond J. Black showed that four legs, when braced correctly, uh, provided the most stable and lightest option. Bendix also designed a unique aluminum honeycomb shock absorbing material, preventing the lander from bouncing on touchdown, which is something you certainly don't want. Uh, the lunar module became the safest part of the Apollo spacecraft and the only one that never suffered a critical failure. Much of this was guided by the work of Raymond J. Black, a Notre Dame graduate who joined Bendix Products Aerospace Division in 1955 as an expert in aircraft and spacecraft landing systems. Black's work is still cited by NASA today as instrumental for landing modules. So why put so much effort into landing gear? The goal of landing on the moon was complicated and dangerous. The Apollo and Gemini programs, though, as we mentioned, rehearsed all those aspects from takeoff to rendezvous in space, orbiting the moon, and returning home. But one thing could not be practiced ahead of time, which was actually landing. Though countless simulations took place on Earth, there were many variables that had to be anticipated. If the lunar module bounced, rolled, sank, leaned, or if the module would not be able to take off again, it would strand the two-man crew on the moon forever, which would be tragic, of course, but also a public relations disaster. Moreover, the composition of the lunar surface was largely a mystery. They didn't really know what it was made out of and how it would land uh, on that surface. And the exact touchdown location was not possible to pinpoint. 
Bendix's design for the landing gear was precisely engineered to compensate for all of these variables, landing Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin as safely as possible. In fact, uh, despite almost running out of gas, the landing went better than anticipated. Commander Neil Armstrong touched down so softly that the shock-absorbing material barely compressed. This left the LEM sitting about three feet higher above the surface than was intended, which meant that the astronauts had to leap to reach the bottom rung. Fortunately, the moon's low gravity made this relatively easy. Aside from the LEM, Bendix was involved in nearly every other aspect of the United States space program. Bendix Aerospace Systems Division in Ann Arbor, Michigan, built the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package called the ALSEP, which was deployed by every Apollo mission after 11 to measure things like moon quakes, solar wind, and magnetic fields. Bendix Launch Support Division at Kennedy Space Center, Florida, operated and maintained the major systems on the launch pad and mobile launch towers. This included the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB, which at the time was the largest single-story building in the world. It was so big that it had its own weather on the inside and could even form clouds and rain on humid days, and has the largest doors in the world at 456 feet high, which of course were operated by Bendix. Bendix made the assembly crane inside, which was operated by a Bendix employee. The connectors for the rocket engines are made by Bendix. The rocket propellant is filled and maintained by Bendix. The crawler transporters needed to move the 6.5 million pound Saturn V rocket were operated by Bendix. The transporters were nicknamed Hans and Franz, and they were built in 1965 as the largest self-powered land vehicles in the world. They travel about one mile per hour and are self-leveling and are actually the only vehicles on the National Register of Historic Places places when put on there in the year 2000. They continue to be upgraded and in recent years have had work done to support future missions with larger aircraft. Bendix Field Engineering Corporation in Columbia, Maryland ran the mission's simulations, comms, procedures, and manuals. They also built electrical components and tracking stations and were essential in coordinating the 11 manned spaceflight network stations around the world that enabled spacecraft to communicate with mission control because you need those radios all around the world so that as soon as that spacecraft goes beyond the horizon, there's somebody else they can talk to. This role extended beyond Apollo to the Pioneer and Skylab programs. And other divisions with a hand on Apollo were the Scientific Instrument and Equipment Division, the Navigation and Control Division, the Microwave Devices Division, the Instruments and Life Support Division, the Fluid Power Division, the Electronic Components Division, and the Cincinnati Division, which I'm not sure what they made. The Apollo 11 mission was scheduled to launch on July 16, 1969. One of humanity's greatest technological achievements, the Apollo program has led to thousands of spin-off technologies from memory foam to solar cells. But in the 1960s and beyond, support for Apollo was actually not all that high. The era was a time of unrest, both at home and abroad. And most Americans polled saw the expense for the mission as political posturing, feeling the money could be better spent domestically. After Neil Armstrong's one small step, interest waned with every major network declining to carry the Apollo 13's live TV broadcast of the launch. The 17th Apollo flight would prove to be the last, as the remaining planned missions were scrapped due to budget cuts. Humanity's mark remains on the moon, and today over 400,000 pounds of material of human origin remain on its surface, which includes flags, pins, a Bible, a photograph of astronaut Charles Duke's family, several golf balls hit by Alan Shepard during the Apollo 14 moonwalk, uh, and of course, uh, parts of the lunar lander. South Bend's Bendix Corporation was bought by Allied Signal in 1983, which is now a part of German company Knorr Bremse. Bendix continues to make breaks, uh, but headquartered in Avon, Ohio, and Honeywell took over Bendix's avionics department. And today, South Bend's Honeywell Aerospace still produces parts for a wide variety of government contracts and has even gone to Mars on satellites and landers, continuing our local tradition of boldly going where no one has gone before.